Deploying a production Kubernetes platform on OpenStack Magnum with Zul. It's an open edX case study. Hi, my name is Namrata, and I will be presenting our story, how we run a distributed, highly available learning platform, Clora Cloud Academy with OpenStack, Kubernetes, Ceph, and Zul. So a major release of platform we run forced us to change our entire stack, and here's what we did. So I work in Clora and the education team, and what we do is that we run the learning platforms. Our platforms are based on OpenEdX, a free open source learning management system. And OpenEdX has two releases a year, just like OpenStack, and they follow a naming convention of botanical tree names. So while the presentation, if I'm man mentioning the names such as maple, lilac, nutmeg, or olive, I'm referring to these specific releases of the OpenEdX platform. So OpenEdX Ma Maple, the release name, which changed everything. So starting from the Maple release of OpenEdX, Upstream deprecated its prior method of deploying the platform using Ansible playbooks. Instead, they decided to move towards a containerized deployment approach. And to adapt to this change, we made the switch from OpenStack Heat to Kubernetes on OpenStack Magnum. This shift allowed us to deploy the OpenEdX platform in containers, and that makes things more manageable for us. It makes uh, more scalable and flexible for us. And alongside these deployment changes, we also had a transition in our CI-driven deployment approach. We moved from GitLab CI to Zul. So uh, this is a summary of the architecture before and after, which also discusses some of the issues which we ran into along the way. And as I mentioned earlier, our platform is built on OpenEdX. Now let me give you a concise overview of what OpenEdX is and what are its uh, fundamental components. So OpenEdX is an open source learning management system. Uh, it's called LMS, uh, an online uh, course platform that allows individuals and organizations to create, deliver, and manage the online education content. So edX platform consists of three main components. Firstly, the learning management system, which is uh, LMS. It serves as the application through which learners can access and engage with the course materials. And uh, the LMS provides a user-friendly interface to interact uh, with the educational content. Secondly, the platform includes OpenEdX Studio. It is an advanced course creation tool that uh, designed for instructors where they can create the content. So it is a content management system for creating courses and course libraries in the OpenEdX platform. And uh, lastly, it's Django admin panel, which allows the administrators to handle tasks such as managing data and setting permissions. So how we used to run OpenEdX. When we started building a learning platform in 2015 on OpenEdX, we adopted a deployment strategy that aligned with the uh, community's recommended approach. Uh, we opted to deploy the platform on cloud server instances using Ansible playbooks. So this is the architecture. And to achieve a cloud-centric and image-driven deployment, we incorporated OpenStack Heat into our workflow and uh, managed our clusters as heat stacks. We used GitLab CI to invoke heat to deploy the platform. So what we migrated to? We migrated to Tutor. So it is a community-supported Docker-based distribution that simplifies deployment, customization, debugging of uh, and scaling of the OpenEdX platform, starting from the Lilac release. And it completely replaced the OpenEdX native method of uh, using Ansible playbooks uh, for OpenEdX installation since the Maple release. So why Tutor came into the picture? So as per the community, it was difficult to install OpenEdX with native installation scripts. For instance, there are no official instructions on how to upgrade an existing platform to a newer release. Like there is a recommended approach to back up the data, trash the existing server, and create a new one. So as a consequence, people tend to run the older releases and are hesitant to upgrade to the newer versions. So how Tutor aims to simplify the installation and upgrade process of the OpenEdX platforms? So firstly is application isolation. Tutor runs OpenEdX processes inside Docker containers, and it provides isolation and encapsulation of the application components. It comes with CLI, command line interface, uh, for common administrative tasks, making it easier to manage and control the OpenEdX platform. And it has a plugin-driven system that allows users to extend or customize the OpenEdX environment without touching the core code base. And uh, it comes with a 
default Kubernetes, inbuilt uh, Kubernetes integration, and it facilitates the OpenTix platform um, integration to the Kubernetes cluster. So under the hood, what it does is it just uh, use a, uh, it wraps the kubectl commands uh, to interact with the cluster. And uh, so Tutor comes with a uh, comprehensive documentation that offers a detailed distribution on how to use the distribution effectively. So if you are interested in learning further, you can explore the uh, Tutor official documentation. So in order to adopt the new Tutor deployment method, our aim was to identify a solution that aligned with following our uh, key goals. So we wanted a CI-driven deployment. Our objective was to achieve a fully automated deployment of the OpenEdX platform to a Magnum managed Kubernetes cluster, um, similar to our previous setup through a CI-CD pipeline. And um, we wanted to have a CI-driven uh, configuration changes. So all configuration and setup changes to the OpenEdX environment are to be done through our Gerrit Zul tool chain. And thirdly, data replication and redundancy. So we wanted to have a deployment model that utilized clusters distributed across two different regions while ensuring data replication between them uh, as we had done in our previous setup. So this would provide redundancy and fail over to a different region for uninterrupted services in case of any incidents. Uh, and stateful configuration and management. So we sought to maintain the ability to manage our OpenEdX platform through a stateful configuration engine. Uh, before this transition, we used uh, heat stacks, and now we wanted to use Kubernetes deployment as our orchestration tool. And uh, lastly, uh, Zul Garrett integration. So instead of GitLab CI, we aim to utilize Zul as a preferred CI CD tool. And uh, Zul Garrett integration would provide the necessary capabilities for code review, job orchestration, and maintaining a smooth development and deployment workflow. So um, after the transition, our tech stack changed. And what does our tech stack look like today? So our cloud infrastructure runs on OpenStack, and we use it both for the infrastructure of the learning platform and our lab environments. So in our previous setup, we used the OpenEdX native installation method, which was deploying uh, OpenEdX onto cloud VMs or bare metal servers using Ansible roles and playbooks. It was called native in OpenEdX lingo because it deployed directly onto cloud VMs or uh, um, bare metal servers rather than into Vagrant managed VMs. And we used OpenStack Heat and Ansible to deploy our learning platforms to OpenStack VMs. After the Maple release, which was transitioning to Docker-based deployment, uh, we containerized the services and run them on Kubernetes. So we use OpenStack Magnum to deploy our Kubernetes cluster. Additionally, we run a self-paced interactive learning platform, which is like we provide the learners to access to complex, realistic, distributed environments on demand where they can learn things by actually doing it, and we use OpenStack Heat to achieve that. While both the deployment of the labs and the deployment of the OpenEdX infrastructure involve the use of Heat, their uh, approaches are completely different. Um, Although we have replaced the heat-driven approach of the platform with the one that interacts with the Kubernetes cluster, uh, we have not replaced the heat-driven approach to deploy our interactive labs. So this is the OpenStack Magnum project logo. So we use OpenStack Magnum. Um, in order to transition to Docker-based deployment model with Kubernetes, we required a container orchestration service and a container registry offering for storing private container images. Um, within our cloud infrastructure, we had two uh, container orchestration services available. One was Rancher, and another was Magnum. We chose OpenStack Magnum because it provided all the necessary components for a production-ready setup for deploying Tutor. So we needed a container orchestration service that could accommodate custom-built Docker images. Uh, and thus, we decided to utilize the private Docker registry provided by Magnum. So the built-in Docker registry runs locally on each Kubernetes worker nodes, localhost. So uh, the Docker registry supported by Magnum is just the official Docker registry image with the OpenStack Swift storage driver. And when invoked by Magnum, it's Magnum that automatically populates the registry's storage configuration with the necessary parameters to match the Swift endpoint in the region which it is running in. 
and we have a CI driven deployment. So we duplicate this for a local running registry instance backed by the same storage credentials uh, that we push our images to. And once we push these uh, images, register these images, uh, these images become available to our Magnum registries. And in our case, it's not OpenStack Swift that backs the registry. We use Ceph Redos Gateway with Keystone integration. And uh, to avoid a single point failure, we don't rely on a single registry. But instead, we have two registries, each in one region. All images are available in both the regions, ensuring redundancy and availability across our infrastructure. And um, OpenStack Magnum lets you create Kubernetes clusters via the OpenStack APIs. So to do that, you need to base your configuration in a cluster template, and the template decides how your cluster will be created. So in a production environment, we use six node uh, Kubernetes cluster, which is three control plane nodes and three worker nodes. And we deploy our cluster with Cinder CSI driver enabled. So we use Cinder CSI driver because we want to create persistent volumes uh, for our Kubernetes cluster backed by Cinder block storage. And we use Octavia, which is OpenStack load balancing serv service to expose our Kubernetes cluster to the outside world via load balancer. Uh, we use the Ceph Object Gateway S3 API to achieve automatic replication between the primary and DR site. We don't use the multi-site replication uh, as provided by Ceph natively. Um, in a Kubernetes environment, the backup and restore process is implementing using cron jobs. So uh, it's the same cron job utility you use in Linux. So cron job allows you to schedule and run recurring tasks or jobs within your Kubernetes cluster. With cron jobs, you can define a schedule uh, using a cron-like syntax, and you just specify the desired frequency and timing for your task. And just Kubernetes will uh, then automatically create and manage those pods and execute those tasks on the defined schedule you have given them. And in our environment, the cron job is responsible for capturing MySQL and MongoDB dumps from the primary site and then uploading them to the S3 buckets and uh, subsequently restoring from these S3 buckets at our disaster recovery site. So that in case of any incident, we can just fail over to our disaster recovery site and our services are up and running. Um, and uh, so company-wide, we adopted Garrett as a code uh, review tool and Zul for our CI CD to, apply, uh, uh, to be uh, aligned with the uh, OpenStack upstream. Uh, so we migrated from GitLab CI um, uh, talking to OpenStack APIs to uh, Gerrit Zul talking, uh, okay. So we make all configuration and uh, set of changes to an open edX environment directly from Zul, um, Gerrit Zul review tool chain and don't do any manual changes to the Kubernetes environment. So we have an end-to-end -end, uh, deployment, tutor deployment to a Magnum managed Kubernetes cluster from Zul. Now let me explain our workflow in more detail, like how we uh, do an end-to-end -end CI driven deployment. So we run multiple platforms, so we have different topic branches for every platform um, uh, that uses a separate Kubernetes namespace. That's how we isolate the platforms from each other. And uh, when making changes to a platform, uh, uh, Azul, uh, so I will uh, send the code review, and when it will be uh, uh, accepted with the updated configuration, a Zul job is triggered to build the corresponding Docker images with these changes. Subsequently, another uh, Zul job pushes that image to a Swift back registry that Magnum makes available to Kubernetes. Lastly, a Zul job that deploys these changes to Kubernetes cluster. So that's how our tech stack looks like. And uh, uh, the issues which we ran after the transition and which we are facing right now also, so we'll discuss that. So first I'll like to discuss a load balancer issue which we uh, faced in a recent incident. We lost access to our learning platforms. It was because the region in our cloud infra where we host our learning platform uh, had a technical issue and we lo lost control uh, and compute nodes. So this incident led to the unavailability of uh, Kubernetes nodes and loss of all load balancers and Kubernetes API services, which are both load balanced behind Octavia. So we lost accessibility to services that expose our OpenEdX platforms, which are load balanced behind Octavia. And also the Kubernetes API service. So as a result, we can't 
um, execute any command against the cluster. Therefore, we can't initiate a fail over to our disaster recovery site as it required to run some scripts against the cluster to make this uh, primary DR switch. So uh, this uh, re incident highlighted flaws in our DR policy and our failover process. Our systems will only work once Octavia is fixed. And uh, Octavia always gets fixed last. There is no way around that. For Octavia to work, Nova and Neutron must work. So after um, you encounter a technical issue, you always get controllers up, and then Nova and Neutron. And then only you can look into fixing Octavia and the broken load balancers. Even after the, these issues are solved and we can communicate with the Octavia API, the load balancers are uh, often stuck in an error state, which we can't fix it on our own. And we need admin uh, privilege, someone with admin privileges to fix it, So, which uh, adds to our downtime. So to mitigate the downtime during the outage, we reconsidered our uh, disaster recovery policy and uh, looked for an alternative solution to expose our OpenEdX platform other than the load balancer and make our platform Octavia free. So for background, we use Caddy as a web server as a, it is used by Tutor for web proxy and for generating SSL, TLS certificates at runtime. So um, we were looking for a solution to expose the Caddy service besides the load balancer. As per the Kubernetes documentation, there are many ways to do that. Uh, you can expose your services other than the load balancer type. So the first approach is cluster IP, uh, which allows the service to be accessed only via an internal IP. So this exposure is not suitable for a production-ready environment because uh, it restricts accessibility within the cluster. The second option, note port, was also not suitable since our caddy service runs on port 80 and 443, and node port range starts from 30,000 to something 32,000. And there is a way not commonly used among the Kubernetes community because uh, many use cloud providers load balancers, which is using cluster IP with external IP. So uh, this solution requires that the customer maps the external IP address of a service to the private IP addresses in the cluster. Uh, but unfortunately, we were not able to make this work in our environment. Uh, we wanted to use floating IP address as the external IP address. So it was because our floating IP address was getting mapped to a different subnet than the one which cluster IP private address was running. So at the end, we were not able to figure out a way to expose our services without load balancer. But uh, we settled with an approach that rather than doing anything with the APIs, we would just operate on a single DNS op uh, record that we could just flip without using any API calls to the backup site. This allows us to have at least a rudimentary service available on the backup site until the load balancer which are failed at the primary site becomes available or are fixed. Um, another issue which we faced, uh, faced was often pods. Now, uh, now let me give you a concise uh, uh, a vocab uh, of Kubernetes, what is often pods and what we faced uh, the issue. So like what are often pods in a Kubernetes cluster? Uh, often pods can occur in a Kubernetes when their owner objects such as uh, deployment, replica set, or replication controller is deleted or modified. So by default, Kubernetes deletes these dependent objects. Therefore, the responsibility of cleaning up this object lies with Kubelet. So what is Kubelet? So uh, the Kubelet is the primary node agent that runs on each node. And it is responsible for applying, creating, or destroying containers on the Kubernetes node. Um, it, uh, and it is also responsible for the garbage collection of unused images and unused containers on these nodes. So when Kubelet fails to delete these often pods or delete these dependent objects, often pods remain dangling in the environment and they hinder with the deployment process. So we are facing this issue while performing a rolling update in our deployment. So what happens in a rolling deployment? During a rolling de deployment, the, control, uh, the controller deletes and recreates the pod with the updated configuration one by one without ca causing the downtime to the cluster. However, our rolling deployment gets stuck when the pod with the uh, mounted persistent volumes running the older version remains in the terminating state and the one that needs to be created with the updated uh, configuration gets stuck in the container creating state. This scenario is encountered with read-write-once uh, access mode for persi persistent volumes. 
if we could use retried many, means um, any num many number of uh, Kubernetes nodes can make the changes, we did not face this issue. Uh, so uh, to understand, when we check the kubelet logs uh, on the nodes, we notice there are massive log entries stating often pod found, but uh, volume paths are still present on the disk. So we dig deeper into the logs and saw that when the pod is uh, trying to get deleted, it tries to unmount that persistent volume. So it tries to unmount that CSI volume. The unmount operation is um, able to unmount the volume successfully, but fails to remove the volume paths from the node. Uh, this problems of gets, uh, pods getting stuck in the terminating state is a, uh, due to inability to clean volume sub path mounts is a known issue in Kubernetes and in many versions. Uh, you can just find the bug report, like in many versions they have faced this issue. Um, uh, but there is no de definite cause what arises the issue. Like they have fixed in many versions and it has reappeared in next versions. So the workaround suggested in the bug reports was to manually delete the often pod directory and restart the kubelet service, which works for all, us also. But um, as I told you, we have a CI-driven deployment. So it's very complicated to manually shell into a node and delete these stale directories um, uh, and restart the kubelet when the pipeline uh, is still waiting for pods to get terminated. They are like stuck in terminating uh, pods, uh, and we have to uh, so I, we have to go into the Kubernetes node, shell into the Kubernetes node, and delete those uh, uh, often uh, directories manually. So, ideally, Kubelet should intelligently deal with the often pods. Cleaning a stale directory manually should not be required. And uh, as per the bug reports, uh, the often pods issue is uh, present in Kubernetes versions up to at least version 1.24. It is possibly fixed in the later releases, which brings our, us to our next issue. So one another, another issue is that Kubernetes release uh, releases available in Magnum frequently are quite behind the upstream. For example, the current most recent Kubernetes version supported in Xena, OpenStack Xena is 1.21. Even after we upgrade to OpenStack Xena to OpenStack Antelope, we get official support for Kubernetes version 1.24. But um, this probably won't fix our often pod issue. So with OpenStack Magnum, we are running the limitation of running older Kubernetes versions or even versions that are end of life. They are EOL. So um, that was the summary of the architecture and our transition and the issues which we ran into. So if you are interested in uh, trying out the learning platform, this is our learning platform. It uh, consists of uh, many courses uh, related to OpenStack Magnum, OpenStack deployment, or Terraform, Ceph courses also, and uh, uh, some quick tutorial also, which we have launched today. Uh, you can just check it out on the link. And uh, uh, that's it. Thank you. So if you have any questions. Yes. Why do you not use uh, multi-site for Ceph? Why do you not use Ceph multi-site? I, I didn't get your question. I think in your presentation you said for Ceph, you don't use multi-site replication. Why yeah, is that? Yeah, we don't use the Ceph native. Uh, it's not uh, supported in our environment. We don't use that. I mean, is there a reason? Uh, I'm not sure about it. I can get back to you, um, but... Uh, uh, we use the replication policy, not uh, uh, not Ceph native. We don't use that. Okay. Okay. If you don't have any questions, thank you.